from Rwanda to outer space, which appears just a bit closer these days. Early this month, Europe's most powerful telescope, Euclid, beamed back its first images to Earth. And last week, the EU held a summit to plan Europe's next steps in exploring outer space. The European Space Agency hopes it's the beginning of an ambitious new era. When it comes to unlocking the secrets of space, the European Space Agency is in pole position. This year, it launched not one, but two high-profile research missions. The first is Euclid. Its job is to measure exactly how the universe expanded 10 billion years ago. Recently, its first images were published. The job of the space probe, JUICE, is to investigate the possibility of extraterrestrial life on Jupiter's icy moons. Then there's Copernicus, the most ambitious program to observe planet Earth. In the future, ESA wants to do more than deliver satellite data. It also wants to use artificial intelligence to predict the consequences of environmental pollution and destruction. Another goal to be a pioneer in the prevention of space junk. The plan is to extend the lifespan of ESA satellites and, after their mission, let them burn up without leaving a trace in the atmosphere. In 2026, the agency wants to catch a 112 kilogram piece of debris from a rocket for the first time. In manned space travel, however, ESA has never outgrown the role of junior partner for NASA. It currently supplies the so-called service module for the US's Orion capsule, along with important building blocks for a planned space station that will orbit the moon. In exchange, European astronauts will likely be able to join NASA's missions to the moon. Three missions are currently under discussion. A huge problem for ESA is rockets. The agency is currently dependent on providers like SpaceX, as its own launch systems aren't ready yet. Ariane 6 is expected to lift off in 2024 at the earliest, four years behind schedule. Let's take a closer look at this with uh, Joseph uh, Aschbacher, who's Director General of the European Space Agency. And Germany's Alexander Gerst has spent about a, a year on the International Space Station during uh, two missions. Uh, welcome both. Shaking hands with an actual spaceman, so this hand won't get washed again quickly. Um, let's start with you, uh, Joseph Aschbacher. Um, we, we heard in the report that, that Europe hopes that this year, that this is the start of an ambitious new era. To achieve what? In fact, uh, just last week in Sevilla, we had a space summit. Uh, and at this space summit, we, we really decided on a paradigm shift of how we want to do space in the future. That means much more competition uh, and uh, that doing it in a very different way. And this is done for launches on one side, but also for exploration. That means to, to have a, a cargo a vehicle that brings uh, cargo up to the space station, is docking there, and is bringing, again, cargo down to the surface. And this is a capability which Europe doesn't have today. And we want to develop this in competition. And, so, and, and competition, so who will be competing for what? Industry will be competing. So we as ESA, we, we will be the anchor customer. Right. We will buy a service, but we, we let industry do it in the best possible way. In a way, we are doing it uh, in a similar way as NASA has done with uh, in the US uh, with the COTS program, out of which, uh, as we all know, uh, SpaceX uh, with uh, Falcon 9 uh, was uh, was developing and uh, really developing into a very very impressive uh, launcher. And you, presumably, your, your hope is that this will be a Euro these will be European companies that, that they that do will this. have to be European companies because as ESA we are spending European taxpayers' money. That means European companies will be allowed to compete. Okay, um, uh, Alexander uh, Gerst, uh, you've had two runs up to the uh, International Space Agency, uh, International Space Station, including one as uh, commander. So. Where do you want to go next? <laughs> yeah, indeed, it was a great, great privilege to fly to the International Space Station for Europe to do experiments uh, to bring back uh, to the European citizen. We did about 700 in different fields of science and like to try to help uh, uh, prevent diseases, to help with new materials. That's uh, really uh, good to do. It's really important for us uh, in Europe to do. It's great that 
that we have continuity uh, with now developing a known cargo spaceship that could potentially develop into a, a human spaceship as well. The next step uh, definitely is uh, going to the moon. Uh, it's the Artemis program that we're involved in that we uh, fly to with European uh, service module of the Orion spaceship together with our partners. We'll, uh, we'll fly to the moon next as, uh, as scientists. Why? Why? We've, we've, we've been there. Or oh, people, I've never been there. You, you've been closer, but you know, it, it's, it's been gone to. Why are people uh, suddenly going back again. Yeah, you really got to see it as a new continent. Uh, it's like Earth's eighth continent, uh, like Antarctica was, uh, like Antarctica was 100 years ago, a new continent uh, that you need to discover. Uh, first of all, because it's there. It's in our, you know, it's our DNA to understand our surroundings. We have to do it. And the moon is the next place to do. Uh, it has a lot of answers for us uh, that uh, concerns ourselves, uh, the security of uh, our species on our planet to defend ourselves from asteroids, it's, uh, it's also an archive of Earth's history. Of potentially, it uh, contains uh, uh, knowledge about how life got to Earth. So uh, uh, it's, it really, really have to discover it because it's there. And 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 uh, just being there once uh, to put up a flag or a few times uh, just doesn't help it. I mean, if you want to understand an entire continent like Antarctica, you have to go there uh, okay. afterwards again and to put uh, down uh, scientific research bases. That's the that's the next plan. But Joseph Ashby. Just on that on that point, we, we, there, are, there are any number of um, missions to the moon at the moment. India's going, uh, China's going, um, the United States, and, and, uh, and now Europe wants to get there as well. So is there any sort of coordination about this, or does everyone just have at it? Well, it's, uh, it's a good mix. There's a bit of competition, obviously, between different uh, countries and different places, but there's a lot of cooperation. And especially the European Space Agency is very well known for cooperating with major partners. We have a very strong uh, cooperation with uh, the United States, uh, with NASA, but also with other partners. Uh, India is one of them, Japan is another one. So we really, uh, and space by, by nature uh, requires us to, to work together. And that's what exactly what we're doing. So was ESA then part of, when India landed on the, was on the far side of the moon, was uh, ESA was involved in that? We were involved. In fact, we provided some of the signals for the landing uh, of this uh, uh, landing vehicle of, of India. Uh, and yes, the role may be a smaller one, but yes, we have been involved. In fact, I've received a very nice letter of thank you from the uh, chair of the Indian Space Research Organization for our contribution uh, to make the success of India possible. Alexander, you, so the moon is is the next mission. Is that is that official? Is, is the moon the next mission? Let me, I mean, he wants to go, but I mean, can he? Is, is he allowed? Well, we have several steps. We go to the space station and then we go to the moon eventually, of okay. course. But the moon is certainly the next uh, big target, yes. All right. And the training sounds I intriguing in Lanzarote and Norway. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the things that all European astronauts do is we try to get ourselves ready for uh, uh, such a mission or s such missions that come up in the future. And one of it is to get everybody on a sort of an equal level in terms of uh, doing science on the moon surface. Uh, some of us have already a background in, uh, like me, in geophysics. Actually, you're speaking to two geophysicists here. Um, so I've, I've worked in the field on volcanoes, but not all of my colleagues have. And so uh, part of the training is to get everyone on an equal level so that we, once we are on the surface of the moon, can work together with scientists who are back on Earth so that we're their eyes and ears and like sensors, uh, geological sensors on the uh, surface so that we're efficient in communicating with them so we can bring back the right uh, rocks for further um, uh, research on Earth. And uh, Alex mentioned in, in, his first, uh, in his first answer that there's a lot of uh, science and um, medical questions that can be answered in, in space, which, which sort of brings me to to my question for you, which is about, I think that ESA's 2023 budget is just over 7 billion euros. So what are we getting in, in Europe for all that money besides some spectacular photos? Uh, we're getting a lot, actually. It's, um, if you divide uh, the 7 billion by the number of people in Europe, about 500 million, okay. including our oh, member states, get a pen. Yes. It's, a, it's, it's about four, 14 euros per person per Fine. year. And that is uh, the prices of, of a ticket, of a cinema ticket. But ESA is developing big cinema for this uh, 14 euros per, per Okay, per I like person. the yeah. analogy. Let, let me push you on that, though. So, so what are the tangible benefits that, that we're yeah. deriving from, from you jaunting off into, well, perhaps not you, but you jaunting off into space? I mean, we're doing so much more than just uh, astronauts. Astronauts, of course, are the most visible part of it. But uh, about half of our 
budget of the 7 billion is spent on Earth observation, telecommunication and navigation, which are really services or the use of satellites for people on planet Earth, especially for climate monitoring, for agriculture, for forestry. So we have uh, estimates uh, which are done by economists and they say one euro invested in, uh, into our space programs bring back about three euros, five euros, in some cases even 10 euros back to the economy because new services are developed, new business is open and uh, if you invest in space, it's going way beyond the space segment. It has a geopolitical dimension, it has an economic dimension, it keeps talents uh, in Europe, uh, but also security dimension and it really is uh, okay. a mix of it and this really is, is, uh, is good value for money for, for the economy. Just a quick word about um, ecological matters because of course you sending rockets into space, that does not look like it's going to be good for anyone's carbon footprint. Um, what are you doing to minimize that? First of all, we're doing a lot of research to be even greener and more sustainable in our, in our space transportation, but also all we do. But we have one of the best, if not the best, uh, uh, program using satellites to monitor our planet. We call it to take the pulse of our planet uh, with the Copernicus program, uh, but also the Earth Explorers and the meteorological missions. And they are necessary to understand our planet, our climate, and uh, to mitigate and uh, to adapt to our climate, but also to understand right. how it works. Good talking um, to you. Thank you so much for, for coming in and uh, joining us. Director General of the European Space Agency, uh, Joseph Ashbacher, and astronaut Alexander Guest. Thank you both.